My name is Anas Gadwani. I am a professor of environmental engineering. Uh, I work on, on water in general, but um, a whole, you know, different kind of areas of water. But lately, I started referring to myself as more of an urban uh, water diplomat than it is a scientist. And I tell you why, or, re or an engineer, because we have no technical barriers to solving water problems anymore. We know everything about it. Anything you want, we can do. Most of the barriers are actually to do with people, with costs, with collaboration, with number of issues that people don't think about initially, so they think we're just gonna get some pipes and pumps and we're gonna solve the problem. That's no longer the issue, in fact, and I'm here to demonstrate that to you. So, the first thing that I have to tell you is that, you know, it's gonna be hard for me to stand on this carpet because when I was, when I was uh, given the, uh, thrown in the deep end to do my first lecture, that was more than 25 years ago, the chair of my department called me and he says, well, we have a problem. One of the professors has gone to hospital and you're teaching on Monday. So the only thing that I could find was this book, random book that I collected about how to teach. And the title was Leaving the Lectern. That was the title. So I hate the lecterns because of that book. So I never stand at the lectern. And the organizers told me to stand at this carpet. So I'm going to try to do my best, but it's more attractive. In fact, it's red. So, all right. So here is the problem. I want to correct a few uh, misconceptions about water. So the problem number one that we have is lots of people go around and say, we are running out of water. So how many of you think that this is true? Show of hands. Are we running out of water? All right. I think you're wrong. Here is why. So here's the number. This is the number. What is it? One billion four hundred and nine million cubic kilometers of water that we always had and we will always have. This number never changed. Right? So there's papers about it. There. So that's the water that we have globally. It never changed. The problem is that we, we have 97% of it in the ocean, and we have 3% that are left. 1% falls in the wrong place, 1% falls in the wrong time, and we have 1% left. Canada owns 20% of that, <laughs> so we're left with 80% of the 1% left, right? And essentially, one of the biggest problems is that we take 70% of all that water and we produce food with it. So that's great because everyone is about food, we want food, you all ate food for lunch. But the biggest problem beyond wasting water in the shower is actually about wasting food. Because 50% of the food that we produce gets wasted. And that's half of the total water that, w that is available to us, in fact. So that's a, that's a big thing. So I want to kind of change your, your thinking about water a little bit around the idea of water is actually across many, many different things. So it's not just the showers. It's not SDG 6 only. It's not SDG 14. It's all SDGs, right? So it's all across. It's how we build cities, as the previous uh, speaker says, how we build communities. So water is all over that. But, you know, the number, the other thing that is really important here is to do with the water that we eat. Not the water that we drink. This is how much water every one of you eats per day. And that's actually based on the food, uh, the water footprint of the food that you eat. So 3,496 on average, obviously. So if you eat some of something or less of something, you will be. But on average, this is a huge number. This is really the impact that we're having is the food that we're that's, that we're eating. Now, not only that, 
But one of my favorite foods is actually the most expensive ticket item, which is chocolate. So chocolate, it costs 24,000 liters of chocolate. What about a tank like this? This is a, a truck. That's how much it takes to, take one, to make one kilo of chocolate. I'm not here to tell you to stop eating chocolate. I love chocolate. And by the way, my mother told me, whatever you say, don't ever bring the bad news to people. Be the one who brings the good news. So the good news, the other something that I want to, you to think about is this other one. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the water that you're wearing. You know, not many people think about this, but a pair of jeans is 7,000 liters of water. That's a big number. A t-shirt is 2,500. Now, you, you see I've stopped there. I didn't want to get into shoes because I, I can see that all of you are wearing shoes and obviously underwear. So that's another 2,000 altogether, 2,500. So there's a lot of water that goes in the clothes that we wear. Now, why am I telling you this? How many of you think we don't have enough clothes in our closet? Okay, the other way of asking the question. How many of you think we have too many clothes? Yeah, everyone thinks that, but nobody does anything about it, in fact. When you think that the moment we start thinking about where is water going? So, you know, if you say, well, you're going to listen to an ad on TV that says, to be a good citizen, you need to take a three-minute shower. You know, and you go like, I've done it. I've done my part of the job. I've taken a two minute and a half shower. Go for it. Take as many showers as you want. That's really not the point. It's about those things that you can make big decisions on, which is the food that you eat, the food that you serve at your, at your dinner, the, the clothes that you wear, and there's a huge, huge impact with, in fact, one of the biggest problem is lots of our clothes, clothing are actually made in places where environmental regulation is not up to scratch. So there's lots of dyeing of clothes, you know, the colors that make it into the water system. And I'm told that anyone wearing red, oops, I'm told that if you wear red, you are actually worse because red is one of those things that doesn't stick well to fabric and then it keeps washing off and washing off into the system. So before your t-shirt looks red, it actually goes into a number of washings and lots of it goes into the waterway. And that's huge pollution. So 20% of the pollution in the world of the waterway is caused by the clothing industry. Now, these are things that we don't hear a lot about. And people, you know, every time I go to places, they go, just give us the solution. How are we going to fix the water problem? I say, well, you know, the water problem isn't really a problem. It's a lifestyle problem that we have. And these are things that we can actually collectively and individually make a decision on. But again, in terms of technology, in terms of Previous speakers mentioned the idea that, you know, we need really more collaboration about how to deliver cities around water and how to deliver sustainable cities. And we have to kind of stay away from that idea that we're walking into a room with a solution. In fact, it's not like that. Greg mentioned wicked problems. Every time we walk into a room, it's not experts trying to come with a solution. It's actually we're here to collaborate with everyone to come up with the solution inside the room, not something that we bring to the, to the room. And I think that's, that's really important. So, uh, you know, sometimes I say to my students, if you want to change the world, I can show you there are 17 ways that you can change the world, right? Now I'm not speaking into the microphone. Can you see it? Yeah? Here you go. I think to address the water issues, there are 17 ways that you can do it, or you can do it actually 17 times, so it's up to you. Certainly the partnership we find, we did lots of work with cities in Australia as part of CRC for water sensitive cities, where we worked with lots of people to deliver 
collaborative arrangement. And lots of the times it's the conversation that you may hear, people are talking, oh, it's the dam, or the desalination, or this or that. It's not one or the other, it's actually one and the other. And lots of the solutions like sponge cities will work in some cities, will not work in others. So we'll have to come up with those solutions that are actually local, that where people can actually connect to, that take into account the historical con uh, consideration, take into account the characteristics, the biophysical. But again, engineering is here to support that, and we, I think we have all the solutions. So that's my message.